The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend on this show, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a bit of fun as we discuss the words that the men and women God has called to direct this church have given us. And in this particular episode, I am joined by a guest, Mike Rush. Some of you may know him. He is a Latter-day Saint author. And so he's going to be joining us to talk about Elder Cook's address from the April 2023 General Conference, Safely Gathered Home. And we said, you know, Mike Rush would be a good guest to be here because we are talking about the gathering of Israel, which is a little bit of a passion project for you, as it is for President Nelson. And before we begin, I want you to just Tell us a little bit about yourself and also share a little conference memory or a conference story or tradition that has stuck out for you. What defines general conference in the Rush household? Um, okay. Well, you know, I'm just a, a regular guy. Um, you know, I'm an accountant by trade. I'm a, a CFO for a privately owned equity company out here on the East Coast. Um one of the uh previously from the great state of tennessee i might add <laughs> that's right that's where we met in franklin uh tennessee which is probably the favorite place i've ever lived um and this uh conference memory that i have is actually from franklin um we always you know all of my kids and i we all uh sit down and we watch conference together <laughs> this one conference there in Franklin, we left the windows open because, you know, in Tennessee, around conference time, the weather is usually just wonderful outside. And we're watching conference, and our cat jumps through the window and drops a live chipmunk in the middle of the floor during conference. And we think it's dead. It looks dead. And <laughs> Then all of a sudden, the chipmunk jumps up and starts running all around, you know, the, oh, no. the <laughs> room we're at. And so, you know, we, we're all trying to get the thing out of the house during conference. And the Tabernacle Choir is singing all features of our God and King or something, right? <laughs> that's that's right. So that that was uh, yeah, definitely a, a fun memory from uh, Franklin, Tennessee. But we we always, my wife will always make uh, cinnamon rolls. Um, that's always one of our favorite conference traditions. Um, then, of course, uh, you know, just, you know, eating those cinnamon rolls while you're watching the conference and brunches and things like that. So we try to make a, um, you know, fun day out of, you know, both Saturday and Sunday. Well, moving on to the the general conference talk here. So this is this is Elder Cook. What was what was your overall impression of Elder Cook's talk here? Safely gathered home. What a great title for this, huh? I thought that it uh, it was a wonderful talk. This is a subject that I could talk about for a long time. Elder Cook is talking for you know fifteen minutes or so on the subject and is covering a a lot of material in a short period of time, and I think that. It, you know, it is such a fascinating uh, topic. And it's one that, you know, not only he talked about, but he references, you know, um, Elder or President Nelson, um, who has said that this is the most important thing happening in the world today, um, gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. And it, if you think about that, uh, it, it makes me rem- uh, think about when uh, President Nelson uh, in conference said, listen, we, you know, I challenge you to study the covenants that the Lord has made uh, concerning the, um, well, with Israel. And I, if you do, you will be astounded. And then, you know, look for those covenants to be fulfilled in your life. And I love it. Uh, President Nelson seems like one of the most dramatic prophets that we've had in a long time in terms of 
just he really gets down to brass tacks says, hey guys this is a dramatic period of time to be alive and he speaks a lot in superlatives i've noticed that and one of the things i often say is prophets are not prone to hyperbole they don't exaggerate things for effect when they something say something is in this case the most important work going on they mean that and when he says this is something that is super critical important we need to focus on he's serious about that in my study um particularly you know, with regards to the last days, there are few things that will shape the world more than the restoration of the house of Israel. Unless you have spent time studying the covenants that the Lord has actually made and the prophecies, you know, with regards to the fulfillment of those covenants, you don't understand that. You know, it's it's just fascinating. You know, why did President Nelson challenge the church to do that, but why didn't he just tell us what those covenants were and why we should be amazed by them? He didn't do that. And and there's been many things like that, that he's come out and said, you know, in the coming day, we are going to see the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. He doesn't then go on and say, and these are what those miracles are going to be. And for reference, this talk that you're referring to, that this is the 2018 talk, right? The the 2018 talk that he gave, uh, Revelation for the Church, Revelation for Our Lives? hmm Okay. You know, and then, if, you know, of course, his, you know, probably one of the most famous um, or most oft-quoted things that he has said is that, you know, in the coming day, we will not survive spiritually unless we, you know, have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives. But he didn't go on to explain why that would be the case. It's clear that... He wants us to do something uh, with regards to these invitations. And when he is inviting us to hear the Lord, to develop that muscle, we should be exercising that muscle with regards to these invitations that he is extending to us. And uh, I think that Elder Cook's talk is, is kind of a glimpse into, hey, if you have taken our prophet up on his invitations, you're going to be starting to consider these kinds of things. It is still a very, very high level, 30,000 foot view of what the gathering of Israel means. Just just think of the, the 10th article of faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. These are two things, and we focus primarily on the first. When you think about the gathering of Israel, that's something that we can do. We can be anxiously engaged in that. We can be involved in missionary work. We can be involved in genealogy and looking for our ancestors and taking their names to the temple and gathering Israel on both sides. But the restoration of something, this is beyond our ability to do. You know, this is, this is greater than what man can do. God restores things. When you begin to study these covenants, you begin to realize, you know, how grand the covenants are pertaining to the restoration of Israel are and how interwoven they are into the uh, the narrative of the last days. Before we get to the last days, something that really stuck out to me in his talk was talking way, way earlier in history. Something that surprised me in his talk was he's, he's describing who is in Israel and how Israel in, incorporates everyone and the seed of Abraham and some of the promises And he adds this paragraph that I felt was out of place. I don't know if you, it caught your attention as well. He said, during the council in heaven, in the pre-mortal existence, the plan of salvation was discussed and sustained. And he specifically puts emphasis on the word sustained there. It included certain laws and ordinances of the priesthood instituted before the foundation of the world and predicated upon the gathering. Now, that is something that caught my attention. Because normally when I've thought of Israel, I've thought of it as the group of people, right? The body of Israel. And it's just the way that history worked out, right? It's this one bloodline. 
and you know huge impact on the world but definitely more of like a temporal thing is what i've always seen it as but then here's elder cook saying no the whole idea of the gathering of israel that is a concept that was set apart before the foundations of the world in the pre-existence and that just i don't know that just kind of kind of blew my mind there and he he cites uh he cites a whole bunch of writings of joseph smith which you can read in the footnotes in the joseph smith papers um and discourses by Willard Richards to substantiate that, that, yeah, this whole concept of the gathering and the restoration of all this stuff about the house of Israel, stuff you would read in Jacob 5 and the allegory of the olive tree and everything, that was the plan from the beginning. And that's just astounding. That That's like part of the plan of salvation. <laughs> I mean, I remember a scripture in the uh, Old Testament that says, you know, when the Lord uh, created the borders of the nations and set, you know, the divisions of the people, he did so according to to the house of Israel. A house that wouldn't exist for thousands of years. Yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> Correct. You know, his son, his only begotten son, would be born into the house of Israel. And when you consider, you know, that your whole council in heaven, what that encompasses, particularly in light of the scriptures of the restoration, I'm thinking particularly of the Pearl of Great Price. Earth is just one of innumerable worlds, which... Worlds without number in their inhabitants, as it says. And is that Moses or Abraham? I think that's Moses, right? Yeah, that's... I, I mean, this is so incredible. And then we have the Doctrine and Covenants in, in, se in Section 76. Those, the inhabitants of these worlds, become the begotten sons and daughters of God through the atonement of Jesus Christ. So you, you have this earth playing obviously a prominent role because Christ is sent here. The house of Israel is here. We understand that this earth is going to be celestialized and it will be the abode of God forever. God is the king of the universe, right? So if he's saying, that is going to be my abode, he refers to the earth as being his footstool. A, a footstool is part of the throne, right? When we talk about, you know, ruling and reigning in the house of Israel forever, I mean, you've got to think of these things. These are covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel. And anyone who is going to, you know, attain the celestial kingdom will be adopted into these covenants. And it's, it's just astounding. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. Most people, when they think of the house of Israel, they think of the Jews. Ancient history, yeah. The Jews, I, I guess, technically, they're one of 13 tribes, right? If you, you consider Ephraim and Manasseh instead of just Joseph. So where's everyone else? The, the covenants say that Israel, Israel will be as if it had not been cast off. So we're not that way right now. It's a tantamount to saying the Roman Empire will be as if it had never fallen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous change in history there to imagine just the, the complete impression of what God is going to do with what so many people consider to be this ancient relic of history that don't, doesn't almost seem to apply to us anymore. It's like, well, I, I almost feel like as, as members of the church, sometimes we look at patriarchal blessings, we're like, yeah, this is what, what's going to be guided. And then there's that lineage thing. I don't really get, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Maybe it's like more just, you know, oh, it's just leftovers from the fact that we're scripturally based or something. Who cares, right? But no, it has a tremendous importance that Israel is making a, making a big return, so to speak. <laughs> a return that will knock your socks off, that will radically change the course of the world. I mean, Jeremiah, if you look at Jeremiah 16, he says, listen, guys. The days are coming when we're not going to talk about the God of Israel that divided the Red Sea. That's going to be old news. You know what we're going to be talking about? The God of Israel who restored the lost tribes. Old news of a contemporary reading. Yeah, that, 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 that is a very contemporary. I mean, that's the, you've heard of the New English translation. <laughs> well, that's my translation of that. But I, that is essentially what it's, uh, what that passage is saying. And it's not the only time in Jeremiah that he says that. Or in our standard works, right? The Bible dictionary. 
Yeah, yeah. You look at the Bible dictionary under the definition of Israel kingdom of, and you look at the last two paragraphs, it basically says, listen, the gathering of the lost tribes of Israel will rival the exodus of Egypt. So (laughs) you think about that and you think about the gathering that we are involved on both sides of the veil, which is awesome. I was a missionary. I have a daughter out on a mission right now. The fact that teenagers are going out in the mission, (laughs) you know, and the gospel is being preached to the world by the mouths of, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. And the (laughs) <laughs> the church has not collapsed is miraculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to think that that rivals the exodus of Egypt, no. This we're, We are talking about something, you know, of the order that, you know, President Nelson is saying, hey, listen, you are going to see the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. Those miracles are going to pertain to the restoration of Israel. This is a belief that is very unique to Latter-day Saints. Elder Cook points this out. Uh, One of the paragraphs in his talk, he said, until the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ, including the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the revelation and priesthood keys given to the prophet Joseph Smith, understanding of the gathering of Israel was fragmentary and limited. And I think still, it, it tends to be a little fragmentary and limited, but it's not for lack of resources. He's saying, look, what we have in the scriptures There is so much there, especially in the Book of Mormon, that most of Christendom is just completely unaware of. That's why you don't hear about the gathering of Israel when you talk to some of your Christian brothers and sisters. It's just not that big of a thing because it's not set forth super clearly, in, especially in the the New Testament, right? That is exactly true. And I, I think that when you look at the Book of Mormon in particular, I'm thinking of Nephi when he has this incredible vision of what's going to take place in America in the last days. And he starts talking about the covenants that the father is going to to fulfill with Israel. And then all of a sudden, the angel goes, hey, Nephi, look over there. And then he sees John and says, see that guy? He's going to write the rest of this stuff and you're not going to write about it can't write this. <laughs> and then, you know, Nephi starts writing, transcribing Isaiah chapters. And the what are those Isaiah chapters about? They're about the restoration of Israel in the last day. I have to wonder, he knew that we had those Isaiah chapters already, didn't he? I mean, yeah. he talks about seeing the Gentiles going forth with the book. So it's not like he's like, hey, in case you guys don't have these 18 or whatever it is, chapters of Isaiah. Let me go ahead and write them for you. He knew that we already had them. He's like, it's so important. We need this much emphasis. I'm going to write them again. And I'm going to put your seminary students to sleep, right? (laughs) Because I'm going to include them because it's that important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Isaiah chapters were so, you know, I mean, Nephi, he felt that he was kind of stretching it by doing, by putting some of these things in like the first you look at the first Isaiah chapters that you know he puts in you're going to see these in what first Nephi uh, chapter 21 and 22 well uh and I I think maybe uh uh, yeah 20 21 that dear listener is the sound of paper scriptures in the background I don't know if anyone remembers those but Mike has they are definitely paper scriptures but I'm not going to read much from these but just just listen to this chapter heading of this Isaiah chapter that Nephi has transcribed this is first Nephi chapter 21 the Messiah will be a light to the Gentiles and will free the prisoners Israel will be gathered with power in the last days. This is the topic of you know, Elder Cook's talk, Israel being gathered on both sides of the veil. With power. With power. And Nephi begins to expound upon Isaiah's words in the very next chapter, in chapter 22. And there can be no doubt that he is, you know, he's transcribed Isaiah and now he's talking about it. When you read the chapter heading of this uh, of chapter 22, it says, Israel will be scattered upon the face of the earth. The Gentiles will nurse Israel uh, with the gospel in the last days. Israel will be gathered. And then Nephi starts ex- you know, explaining a bunch of this stuff. And then in verse 29, 
he says this, And now I, Nephi, make an end, for I durst not speak further as yet concerning these things. What's the big deal? We're talking about the gathering of Israel. Why can't Nephi spill the beans on what you know is going on? Well, he's thinking about the things that he saw in the vision and the angel saying, hey, Nephi, John's going to write about this stuff. You're not going to write about this stuff. Isaiah's going to write about this stuff. Nephi, you're not going to do it. Was it because Nephi was so plain? Like, Nephi, you're too straight a shooter. We're going to let Isaiah handle this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, isn't that interesting? I mean, the people that, that wrote about this, the experts, John the Revelator, uh, Isaiah, the people that we're told to study. The ones that are also the hardest to study. <laughs> they're also the hardest. It's like the Lord is testing us in these things. But when you really begin to study this, you begin to see this picture of what will take place in the last days, what some of these covenants mean. I think that that's why the Lord has said, okay, Isaiah is going to talk about these. Uh, John's going to talk about these. All of the prophets that were involved in periods in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon during the scattering of Israel, they were the prophets that gave us the most insight into these things. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Ezra. These guys were living in captivity. Daniel, uh, they saw the beginning of the Lord's you know, promises. They saw the business end. They were really interested in the, the nice ending, everything being wrapped together in a bow. <laughs> that, that's, and the Lord shared it with them. You, you, to me, it's very similar to how Christ spoke in parables so that you know, the people that were you know, lukewarm, that didn't, they weren't totally committed, they got you know, the surface lo- you know, level of understanding, kind of like the, an onion has layers. They were at the very outer edge. It, it's so fascinating. There's so much depth to these things. Adding the layers like that is, is merciful in that it doesn't add a ton of condemnation and accountability to those who don't understand, right? Whereas it does give incredible light and knowledge to those who do, as Jesus said, have ears to hear and eyes to see. Yeah, what, one of my favorite scriptures on this topic is from 3 Nephi uh, 26. I'm going to paraphrase it using my same translation that I used for uh, Jeremiah. But <clears throat> this is Mormon who's com- you know, compiling all of these records together. And he was totally invested in what the Lord told the Nephites. And he was, go- he was about to explain everything. And the Lord tells him, Mormon, you're not going to do that. You're going to give them this tiny portion, which is the lesser portion. And if they will read this, then they'll receive more through the Holy Ghost. But I'm giving them this to try them to try their faith, for I will try the faith of my people. And I, I think that that is fascinating. There's, there are many prophets in the Book of Mormon that understood these things and were constrained from talking about them beyond a certain point. And you see that same kind of constraint with our current prophet, who points us to these things and says, guys, study this. And if you do, it's going to blow your socks off, I promise you. And then we get to choose whether we're going to follow him or not. Um, And he drops these little Easter egg bombshells that if you're (laughs) you're listening... They go to conference looking for Easter eggs. (laughs) That's (laughs) Like it's a new Disney show or something. I I 14 things you missed in the latest episode of General Conference. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, but... Uh, how else do you, uh, you know, <laughs> explain something like, hey, guys, in the coming days, you're going to see the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's to me, that's an Easter egg bombshell kind of a thing. Like, holy cow. And how does he say something like that? And we're like, oh, what a nice talk. <laughs> in the last general conference, the most recent one, he quotes directly from First Nephi 14, 14, which is you know, the Lord fulfilling his covenants with the house of Israel and arming the saints with great power because of what's going to be, 
you know, taking place on the earth in those days when the Lord begins, you know, to remember those covenants and to bring them to pass. If you haven't taken him up on his prior invitations, you don't see the the relevance and the importance of some of those statements. Yep, you got to be paying attention. And Elder Cook's pointing out he's able to do his own work. We don't need to study the ark, but we do have some responsibilities when it comes to Israel as well. So while the Lord is taking care of the restoration and bringing those 10 tribes back, to an extent, we are also deputized to come in there and participate in the gathering of Israel. And this is where most of his talk focused on. He talks about the Polynesian islands and the great success that we've had over there among scattered Israel. He talks about the success we've had in the British Isles. He talks about the history a little bit. And then he says, now, when it comes to the gathering, we need to expand our vision even more. And he brings in that President Nelson quote. He says, anytime you do anything that helps anyone, again, prophets, not prone to hyperbole. This is a lot of superlatives. This is a very wide net here. Anytime you do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil, take a step toward making covenants with God and receiving their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. It's as simple as that. I want to get that printed and put on like, you know, the background of my phone or something, because it's so easy to get discouraged and caught in the weeds. And here he pivots to talking a lot more about missionary work. It's so easy to say, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not seeing any, I'm not seeing any success. Right. I mean, you remember you were a missionary, you know, knocking on all these doors and no one wants to talk. And it's one out of a hundred thousand that actually talks to you and wants to actually take that responsibility and that covenant upon themselves. And you're like, I'm supposed to be out here gathering, but I feel more like I'm wasting time. And he's pointing out, it's like, regardless of the outcome, regardless of what success, define success, right? What success you do or don't think you see, anytime you do anything that helps anyone, you are gathering Israel. And that's where the Lord is saying, hey, I'm going to bring about this dramatic thing that's going to rival the exodus of Egypt, that's going to, in the New Mike translation, knock your socks off, and you get to help. And you know what? No matter how small of an effort it is, it's still participating in this fantastic, great work. And you get some credit for that. I mean, that is just so cool to be involved in that. It makes me think of, you know, I, I call it the mini millennium. <laughs> yeah, fourth Nephi period, where, you know, Anyone who made it to that period of time, the scriptures say, hey, there wasn't a soul lost. I mean, those people, they were all gathered. If you just survived those events, the Book of Mormon is the template for our days, right? So it was written by a people preparing to meet Christ for a people preparing to meet Christ. We know that you know things are going to get challenging. I mean, just look at the attack on faith in general general Christian values, the goodness, the inherent goodness in the United States of America, and the family itself, everything is under attack. If you can help people to hold on to the faith, whatever faith that they have, not to give it up, to survive this trial of faith, well, guess what? You are gathering Israel because if you can help these guys get across the finish line into, you know, this millennial period, you know, that is the battle. Survival of some of these things with your faith intact. Even the very elect, according to the covenant, are going to see things that they're not going to have a box for. It's going to rattle them. I mean, there are scriptures that say that the heavens will shake, not in a good way, meaning men's faith in the heavens will be shaken to the point that they just don't believe. And one of the things that we can do as disciples of Jesus Christ, and it's, it's a responsibility that we have, is to help people to retain their faith in the face of of such incredible opposition that is going to come. It's going to be much worse than what we have seen today. And see, if you and I had had this conversation four years ago, I would have said it needs to be something just clear and dramatic to shake someone's faith that much and to have the kind of impact that you see described there, right? Where it talks about the 10 virgins, the prophets have told us that represents the church, that half of them are not going to be prepared. 
I would have said, okay, it has to be something just incredibly oppressive and incredibly difficult. And then you watch the effect that we've seen the last few years and people dropping like flies left and right because, oh, I don't like the church on its social policies. I don't like the church on its vaccine policies. I don't like the church on this, on that, on the finance and stuff. It's like these small, relatively, right, compared to what I had been anticipating, these relatively small things. And we're seeing just this massive contention that precedes a massive, if not gradual exodus. And it's like, wow, if, if we are shaking, a lot of the saints are shaking over little small blows like this, you know, a few bad headlines in the press or, you know, reactions to COVID or LGBTQ or whatever. What's going to happen if there is something big and dramatic? Yeah, exactly. That's why, I mean, you, you go and you read some of these scriptures about few people being left. Like just just read the chapter heading of Isaiah 10. Yeah, it says that few people will be left when the Lord comes again. I'm in the younger generation. I look at just the kids that I was in mutual with, and it's like 15, 20% maybe are left still active of the ones who were active back when I was a kid, 2004 to 2009. Yeah. It's stark. It's freaky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, statistic is, is pretty consistent throughout the church. And, and like you said, I mean, the, the topics that we have, I mean, things are becoming confusing. We're starting to see the things that Isaiah talked about where, you know, the world's kind of flipped upside down and, you know, wrong is right, black is white, you know, up is down, that kind of a thing. It's it's, it's very confusing. The, Satan is a master at what he does. We are seeing, you know, what a tremendous artisan he is at his craft. The world is being deceived. The elect are being deceived. And you really need to know how to hear the Holy Ghost in your life if you're going to survive this. You know, surviving what we're seeing now, what the world has been seeing has been shaking many people off, but it's also been waking many people up. Across faith lines, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, holy, holy cow, I can't, I can't believe how stark some of these lines are becoming helping people to be able to see that and to retain their faith and not abandon it, that is gathering Israel. A lot of people think about you know missionary work as knocking on someone's door and handing them some literature. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is missionary work, but also helping someone retain whatever faith that they have in the Lord. And guess what? You know, during the millennium, at the beginning of the millennium, you're going to see people there from all walks of life, all faiths that have made it there because they listen to the still small voice and the Lord's going to sort them out. Well, we often think about the millennium as just being church members. And yeah, at the end, sure, that's going to be. But like you said, fourth Nephi is our template. In fourth Nephi, when the voice of Christ spoke to the darkness, he didn't say, hey, all you bishops who survived, right? And hey, all you, you temple recommend caring members who, who made it. No, he's, he's speaking words to the general population. He says, oh, ye who are spared because you were more righteous than they, not because you belonged to the right church, not because you had ticked all the right boxes. Now, certainly in Bountiful, maybe that was the case, but it was just everyone who just was just kind of trying, right, <laughs> actually made it. It didn't have to be, you know, that you specifically belonged to Church of Christ. In fact, again, given the words of Jesus in the darkness and their reaction at the mount when they're like when the prophecies are being fulfilled they're obviously not super familiar with the prophecies or remembering them it wasn't all just the cream of the crop church members it was just the cream of the crop of everyone generally the the people that heard that still small voice and they were acting on it and they were not persecuting and casting out you know, the righteous from them they were not i mean it it seemed like the bar was pretty low when you you hear you know, Christ's voice to the Nephites, you know. Bless you who didn't kill the prophets. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for doing I me a solid say- and not destroying my servants for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just think that, uh, you know, most people, they're just not prepared for what is coming down the pipeline because, A, they don't understand the covenants that yes. was made pertaining to the house of Israel. and we have this tendency as a people to kind of look at the scriptures and 
interpret them figuratively. Like everything figuratively. <laughs> yeah. Look at all of these major prophecies in the Old Testament of the initial scattering of Israel. How much of that was figurative? <laughs> you know, for the 10 tribes, how much of that destruction was figurative? I mean, they were wiped out. They, their lands were left desolate. The Jews, they were removed from you know, Jerusalem. Jerusalem was left uninhabited. Those weren't figurative. So why are we thinking that that's figurative now? There are things in the scriptures that are figurative, but when we chalk everything up to figurative, and, and I, I myself am one who tends to do that sometimes, that's kind of falling into the trap Moroni is saying, where he says, woe unto you who, de who deny the miracles of Christ. And I always say, oh, I would never deny the miracles of Christ. But then to say, well, you know, everything's just kind of figurative. It's going to be more of a spiritual. Well, okay, that's kind of denying the miracles of Christ a little bit and saying, or as he said, or to say that God doesn't work by power anymore. Yeah. There are so many incredible prophecies that, you know, in the, in the Isaiah chapters, in the book, specifically about the restoration of Israel. For example, when Isaiah asks the question, can a nation be born in a single day? You know, he's asking that because when Israel is restored, it will be as if a nation was born in a single day. You know, there's other chapters where it's talking about the Jews as a desolate woman who has lost her children. And then of a sudden, she sees this host and goes, whoa, who has begotten me these? These, where have they been seen since I have lost my children? And in, again, in a single day, these children say, hey, there's not enough room here in our ancestral lands of inheritance. Make way, you know, that we may have more space. I mean, these things, they're not figurative. These will be literal. The lands of Israel will literally be overflowing with Israelites. The American continent will literally be a safe haven of Joseph. The New Jerusalem is literal. It will be an incredible city of refuge for the saints worldwide that will be gathered to it in miraculous ways that will knock your socks off. I mean, this is kind of Luke 17 kind of stuff. There are two people in the field and one is taken and one is left. There are two people in a bed, one is taken, one is left. Two women at, a, at the mill, one is taken, one is left. I mean, Joseph Smith actually adds a bunch more verses to that section. And he's talking about, hey, the saints are going to be gathered to Zion during this. This is what's happening. People are being miraculously gathered. These are some of the you know, covenants and promises the Lord has said he is going to do. So we need to we need to spend more time um, in the scriptures and understanding you know these things. But it is up to us. I mean, just you, you can take it from President Nelson, who points us in you know the direction. Well, in that Revelation for the Church, Revelation for Our Lives talk, President Nelson quotes Elder Maxwell. He says, "Oh, there is so much more the Heavenly Father wants to tell you." And then he quotes Elder Maxwell, who said. To those with eyes to see and ears to hear, it's clear that Heavenly Father is giving away the secret to the universe. Exactly. As people draw near unto the Lord, he draws near unto them. We need to start listening to the prophet. I mean, we, we listen to general conference, but do we really act on what he has said? Give me nice warm fuzzies. Have you done anything? Did you do those things? As members of the church, we are very good at listening to conference talks. But when it comes to some of these things that he has asked us to do, it's, it's kind of like, you know, in the Book of Mormon where Christ gives this bombshell discourse on what's going to happen to the Gentiles in the last days if they reject him. And then he commands everyone to study the words of Isaiah. Like, does it have to be Isaiah? <laughs> <laughs> you know, isn't that kind of like these Easter egg bombshells that President Nelson has given us? You know, where they're these incredible things that are meant to invite us to take action. And whether or not we do take action is entirely up to us. But 
those of us that listen and act on his counsel, we're putting oil in the lamps. Those of us that are present during general conference and are listening to the cool talks, and then we're going about our days. This is the parable of the 10 virgins. The Lord requires more of his saints than the fact that we were lying on the couch semi-conscious during, you know, several hours on a Saturday and a Sunday of general conference. And maybe we we listened to some talks in in a car while we were driving some. That isn't the box that the Lord is wanting us to check on these things. He wants us to act on this and and start to see the vision and look for the fulfillment of these covenants in our lives. When you talk about the need to seek personal revelation, even on these subjects, Satan wins when he can get us to either end of the extreme is what I've noticed. I, I see a lot of people in the church, in, especially influencers and stuff, who talk about personal authority and the necessity of personal revelation, and then they elevate it above priesthood revelation to the point where you can go ahead and start excusing yourself from the standards and the doctrines and the policies of the church because, hey, I prayed and I got a warm fuzzy about being able to violate one of God's commandments. And then on the other end of the extreme, you have uh, people, and this is maybe the way that I tend to lean more, is you know be very suspicious of personal revelation because I know that I'm really susceptible to deception. And so, and this is where Elder, um, I, I believe it was Elder Cook's last conference talk where he talked about a framework of personal revelation. He said, you have to operate within the guardrails of the existing divine revelations that have been given through the prophets. And if you ever receive something that tells you to go against the counsel of a prophet, or that contradicts the doctrine of the church, you know 100% that that's not from the source you suppose, as Elder Oak said. That's exactly right. There's that wonderful thing where if you avoid both of those extremes, Satan would love to pull you down the person revelation trumps everything train and then trick you into going against the church and against the Lord. And he would love for you to just say, okay, I'm content with just the light knowledge that is clearly and explicitly set out for me. And I'm not going to ever ask Heavenly Father about anything at all. I'm just going to wait to be spoon-fed by the prophet. I feel like there's this middle ground where God says, you have perfect faith in my servants, and you trust their words, and you hold to it assiduously. But you also say, just the plainly spelled out stuff in the scriptures is not enough. I want to receive revelation. I want to develop a personal relationship with the Lord where I can grow in the spirit of revelation. That's, you know, that's exactly right. I mean, it, again, pointing back to the Book of Mormon, you have experiences where people had demonic personalities appear to them as if they were angels of light, giving them these messages that completely contradicted the gospel. Yeah. Okay. Like, Sharon, use your brain. What kind of an angel says, I'm sent from God, but also there is no God? I mean, I should have triggered a red flag there. Wait a second. That, your message is internally inconsistent with your existence. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, he's going, holy cow, this is cool. This is an angel. Look at this light. Look at what he does. He does supernatural things. But Sherm didn't even believe it at first. He went out and started preaching it. Only when he started being successful did he actually believe this internally inconsistent message from the supposed angel from a not God, right? Yeah. But, I mean, you can see that pattern playing out. I mean. Oh, yeah. 4,000 likes on Instagram and people are buying my faith transition cards, right? Yeah. You know, or some of these crazy people that have, you know, done some ridiculous things that you go, holy cow, how did you even think that that was the Lord talking to you when, I mean, these things are so far out of the guardrails. You should have known that the source was not the Lord. We can, we're we all prone. I mean, we, we live on an earth that is inhabited by Satan and one third of the hosts of heaven that followed him. And you know, they're all around us and they're putting thoughts and, you know, concepts and ideas in our minds. We have these same kinds of experiences ourselves. We just need to realize, hey, does this jive with the gospel or am I receiving some new, you know, fangled revelation that goes up and, you know, above, you know, that that's when you should know, hey, yeah, 
eh, eh, eh. <laughs> you know, that's the the alarm should be going off. I mean, it should not be so easy for people to be deceived, but uh, yeah, <laughs> they are, and it's going to get worse. It's going these kinds of deceptions are going to be packaged better and better. They're going to be more attractive and more appealing to us. And the gospel contained within the guard rails is going to look more archaic and old fashioned and out of date. When Jesus says narrow is the way, boy, you see that. I, I, I was so confused by it until you start realizing, oh, as a percentage of the quote unquote, you know, your truth paths that you could go down. This is just one option out of a million. And it seems too constricting. I understand the narrowness of the way now, why he said that that way. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Well, Elder Cook finishes off by talking about the remarkable blessings. Right, So we've just talked about how difficult it can be and just the deck being stacked against us in so many ways. But Elder Cook promises there are remarkable blessings in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The scriptures speak of joy and peace, forgiveness of sins, protection from temptations, and sustaining power from God. And then he closes with the prayer. And remember, we're talking about Israel. A lot of it, God's going to do himself, and we get to help out with a small part, but what blessings are available for it? It says, my specific prayer for today is for every child, young man, young woman, family, quorum, relief society, and class to review how we individually and collective accept dramatic counsel to help gather Israel that has been issued by the Lord and our beloved prophet. And boy, that that just gives me a nice little boost of spiritual energy. I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to people, I'm going to do something. Again, anytime you do anything that helps anyone, you're helping to gather Israel. Yeah, well, just like your podcast, like this. I mean, this is that you're do this is something. I mean, the Lord can take your efforts and he can magnify them. But if you don't do anything, it's pretty hard to magnify nothing. The Lord can't drive a parked car. Yeah. <laughs> that's that that's right. You 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 got to start moving. I mean, you can take a very small number and it can be multiplied and compounded into a very large number. And this is coming from a financial guy, by the way, guys. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I can promise you that any number multiplied by zero is zero. <clears throat> so you've got to, to do something and the Lord can can magnify that. And how many times are we told in the Doctrine and Covenants that there is nothing more important or more beneficial to you than feeding my sheep, gathering people, sharing the light, sharing goodness. That's what the Lord did. That's what we should be. We should be the salt of the earth. It doesn't take much salt to have a dramatic you know, influence on how something tastes. I found that out the hard way the other day. Throw away a good bowl of grits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's be the salt. Let's be more active and putting our beliefs out. I mean, that's why I started putting out YouTubes. And, you know, frankly, I, I was shocked when people started watching. Them. Again, it goes back to the, you know, the Lord can magnify weak and simple things. And he loves doing that. We need to be wise stewards and we don't need to be commanded in all things. I mean, you know, who commanded you to do this, this podcast, right? I mean, we have to have, you know, ideas to do things and then start, you know, hey, yeah, what can I do? And let's start, you know, acting on it. Not everybody needs to do a podcast or be a YouTube guy or write books. In lots of different ways, just how you interact with other human beings, you know, but being a light when the world is becoming so dark, that's being a watchman on the tower, it's shining the the light to the, you know, poor wayfaring seaman. I mean, it's, it's being a beacon. Well, let's talk about some ways that you can be a beacon as we close out. Where can they find you, our listeners? I have a website, thelost10tribes.com. Um, you can go there. That's the number 10, by the way. Yeah, one zero. Um, or you can just, on YouTube, just type in my name, uh, Michael B. Rush, and you'll see some of my uh, YouTubes. All, a lot of my YouTubes will have my uh, website on the actual 
YouTube kind of in the little ticker at the bottom. And for those who are tried before you buy cheapskates like me, your audio book, your first one, I believe, is uh, you, you made that available for free, right? Uh, yeah, you can download it from my website or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Just type in A Remnant Shall Return. That's my first book. The book is uh, focused on the house of Israel, the covenants the Lord has made with the house of Israel. You know what? I had somebody send me this Excel spreadsheet the other day. I mean, okay, given your profession, you get sent Excel spreadsheets a lot, I'm guessing. Yeah, but this was every scripture I'd ever quoted about the house of Israel or other covenants the Lord has made. I I was shocked by it. There were almost 4,000 different scriptures. This is everywhere in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Once you begin to see this, it's a pattern that is omnipresent. Israel's big. It's a big deal. Shows up in all the standard works, and it ain't going away. It's not a historical relic. It's not just something in the history. Israel is, in a very real sense, our future. As President Nelson said, the most important thing happening on either side of the veil right now pertains to the House of Israel. Yep. So everybody go out and get started with the gathering. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discuss Elder Cook's talk, Safely Gathered Home. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. You can find links to all our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org, where you can also follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, find the resources we mentioned in this episode, or learn more about me or any of your other hosts. If you want to follow me, Matthew, you can find me on Twitter at Joyful Repenter or at my blog, PowerInTheBook.com. And big thanks to our podcast guest, Michael Rush, for joining us today. You can find him at The Lost 10, that's the number 10, Tribes.com. But while we always appreciate new followers, it's even better to follow the prophet and apostles themselves. Remember, although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions for which... We invite you to turn in next week. More personal opinions on the Conference Talk Podcast. Mm-hmm.